Hello, Michelle and Jeff. I'm Colin C. Campbell. We have Jeffrey Sass and Michelle Van Tilburg. And today we're talking all about trade show hacks and tips and tricks. And let me tell you this. I don't think I've known anyone to go to more trade shows than Jeffrey Sass. And I'm going to kick it off with this. Last week, I called up my son who is entering his third year of college. And he actually has not gone to college in person. He did it um, through Zoom for two years. This is in Canada because of the pandemic. But he walked into college and I asked him, where are you sitting in class? And he said to me, Dad, not only am I sitting in the front row, I'm also sitting closest to the professor. So the first hack that Jeff came up with and I know Jeff, we're going to get to you in a second here. But the first hack was let's sit in the front row of a trade show. And I'm telling you this, almost 50% of the time, you would see uh, the speaker mention us and or our company. And of course, we were sporting the shirts, which is hack number two. Michelle, you're leading us today. Take it away, Michelle. And Jeff, I'm really looking forward to hearing about all your secrets revealed. Excellent. Wow. So Jeff, as Colin said, he is the master of trade shows. He's actually the CMO at Paul, P-A-W.com, a premium pet company uh, that sells beds and really cool waterproof rugs. And Jeff also has a book. So Jeff, uh, tell us the title of your book and a little bit about that. And then I'm going to kick it off with you on the first question but i'm going to say before we turn it over to jeff here for the little um intro about his book is if you want jeff's book which you're going to learn about it's a really cool marketing book send an email to hello at startup club and the first five people that do so are going to get a free electronic of jeff's book um so along that lines i'm going to tell a little bit about jeff too not only is he good at doing trade shows, but this is a person that always makes money at trade shows, which I think a lot of us know that sometimes that's very hard, but I've never seen anybody who work harder to actually get leads and close deals in addition to having a phenomenal show um, trade show experience. So Jeff, over to you. Tell us about your book first. All right, well, clearly my reputation exceeds me. So thank you, uh, Michelle and Colin. Um, yeah, the, the book is called Everything I Know About Business and Marketing. I learned from the Toxic Avenger. Um, and it really is a business and marketing book uh, with tips I learned spending seven and a half years making low budget action horror films for a studio in New York called Troma. Um, if you're not familiar with them, you can Google them. I will say there's a sequel coming out later this year uh, to The Toxic Avenger, which has been turned into a big budget studio film with um, a lot of uh, with Kevin Bacon as one of the villains uh, and a lot of big uh, famous people in it. So you'll be hearing a lot more about The Toxic Avenger besides my book. But we're here to talk about trade shows today. And, and I'll have to say that in every position I've ever had from my very first job out of college, I've always been in a role that involved going to trade shows and oftentimes organizing and, and setting everything up for those trade shows. So I went to my first trade show back in 1980, uh, and I've probably gone to anywhere from five to a dozen trade shows a year ever since. So if you do the math, I would say it's safe to say I've probably attended, exhibited at you know over 250 um, trade shows over the past uh, 40 some odd years. So I've had everything go right and everything go wrong. I've had, uh, you know, shown up without my booth showing up. I've had no budget to put together um, booths and I've had massive budgets. When I went to work for a company called Game Tech in the video and computer game business back in 1994, um, one of my first assignments when I joined them as director of marketing was to set up their trade show booth for uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And I was handed a budget of $278,000 
just for the booth design, which blew my mind because prior to that, I had no budget when it went to doing a trade show. So I've dealt with big budgets. I've dealt with no budgets and um, had lots of fun experiences. And I've written down about 30 some odd different little tips and hacks and things I've done. Um, and there's some stuff, there's a chapter, at least one or two chapters in my book that talk about trade shows. But I'll give three little quickies just to start us off. And then I know Michelle and Colin um, have some questions and also we want to encourage you to come up, raise your hand, come up on stage and join us and share some of your um, tips and tricks for having a successful trade show. But I will say, as, as Michelle mentioned, you know, one of the objectives we always try to have when going to a trade show is to do enough actual business at the trade show to cover the cost of attending. So that's the bare minimum, because a lot of the, a lot of the work is in the follow up and a lot of the sales come from the follow up. But you want to at least try to make enough actual closed deals right there on the show floor to cover your cost of attending that show. That's a good benchmark as a way to determine if you're having a successful show or not. Um, but I want to give three quick tips and then, then I'll turn it back to Michelle and Colin and, and hopefully some of you will come up and share your tips at all. But number one is it's really important to have a plan B. Uh, and what plan B is, what would you do if you got there and none of the stuff that you shipped in advance had arrived? Your booth is not there. Your table's not there. Your carpet's not there. Have a plan in mind of how you can make it work even if you didn't have a booth? Could you get by with just a clever table and chair or do something creative that could fill the space without your actual booth if it doesn't show up? So have a plan B. And along the same hey, lines with that do you remember, plan B. Do you, what, what, Jeff, do you remember yeah. the, the one in China that we went to and VeriSign had bought every booth in the show? And do you remember what we did? We, we said, okay, well, we're pretty much blocked out. We can't buy a booth. This was the Verisign runs dot com and we were dot club. So we decided to just sit in the lobby of the hotel and meet people as they went in and out. Is that, well, that's the I lobby. That was pretty lobby so I'm sort of like, it's on my list is, is doodle. That's doodle on your list, but I was thinking that was sort of fun because like what you're saying is if you don't even have a booth, you can still do business. Absolutely. But that's the lobby conf. I was really talking about if you have a booth space, but you don't have your booth, your booth doesn't your physical booth your pop-up things. So, so the tip I have is you always want to travel, actually travel with the bare minimum you could get by with to set up your booth. So meaning travel with a couple of pop-up banners, travel with uh, a supply of the core collateral that you might need, travel with your business cards, meaning bring them on the plane with you, bring all these things with you on the plane when you travel so that in the event, all the other stuff that you've shipped in advance and expect to be there if it doesn't show up or if it gets lost or if it's late, you actually have a minimal amount of stuff to actually make the show work for you. You can put your banners up, you've got some collateral collateral you can put out uh, and you've got your business cards. And along those same lines, have a USB drive with you with digital files for anything and everything you have printed and sent or might need so that if you do show up and nothing's there, you can go into the business center in the hotel or you can go to a Kinko's or a FedEx store nearby and stick that USB drive in and print out anything you need. Print out your flyers, print out banners, et cetera, et cetera. So always have a USB drive with you with all your digital materials, even if you have everything printed and sent to the um, event in advance. Um, so those are a couple just to get us started. I've got a lot more on my list, but I'll stop for a moment in case Michelle or Colin have other questions. And, and again, so if you want to share one of your tips, raise your hand. So it's sort of like Murphy's Law, right? Things, that, things will go wrong in any given situation if you give them a chance. So whatever could go wrong will go wrong. And when you're running a trade show, you're on a clock, right? There's no, okay, let's delay the trade show a day. The show must go on. So if your flyers don't show up, you got a backup. If the booth doesn't show up, you got a backup. I love it. Very cool. All right. There's so many cool hacks. So um, I'm just going to throw out a couple and then we'll get to Michael, who has joined us on the stage. So one that's really helped me infinitely, I, actually, I'm going to say two. Is being, you know, it's along the lines of Jeff, but it's more on the meetings. 
I, you know, served many, many years, you know, in uh, marketing and business development. And my hack is to be very prepared from the business standpoint. So I would go through the whole attendee list. Um, I set up what the targets are and I have talking points, which is really important. I literally make little folders for each person that I'm having a meeting with so that I can have an extremely productive meeting. So it's like Jeff's on the preparedness front and it's being very prepared beforehand. I have meetings set up, dinners set up and little folders so that when I hit the ground with the team, not just myself, we 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 know where we're going we know what we're doing and we know what we're proposing to people and i can tell you that has helped so much in terms of you know building a business from a startup to a company that we sold to godaddy so that's one being prepared from the meeting and who you're going to meet like know what you're going to do and then the second one i have is i like to do notes afterwards right so do the preparedness before on each person etc i'm ready we know what we're going to say we got three talking points we're going to hit it we have an offer etc the next point is you know follow up with them immediately like this is where i really have seen so many people fall down they just you know they don't follow up they're really lackadaisical about it I'm even as bold many times if we had a good conversation and, you know, I made an offer, whatever it is, uh, what I was doing was distribution. Um, I, I'll literally send them the agreement and say, hey, this is what I think we talked about. Do you have any, you know, comments? Are you ready to sign? So I try to like move things right along um, very quickly so that I know that everybody's time, the company's time, my time and money was spent wisely. So that's my contribution, Colin. Yeah, and if you're in the audience and you think this is a topic of interest, please feel free to share it on Clubhouse. It's the second icon on the left right there. there I just shared it myself. I think it's a pretty cool topic. You can do a lot at trade shows and, and make an impact. Michelle, you also had another little like cool thing that I learned from you. When we showed up to the conference, you would order from like a uh, food delivery service, <laughs> cheese and wine and alcohol. And we would put that in, in, a, in, a, in the hotel room. We generally rented a nice suite. And then we would have an after hours party, but really it only cost us a few hundred dollars. Yet every time we put on a, an event like that, we had like 50, 60 people show up in our industry. And I just thought that was, a very cheap and cool hack that you know brought people together and sort of like um elevated dot club at those conferences yeah and it worked right more importantly so it really worked uh yeah like people would be spending tens of thousands of dollars and our parties would end up being more popular we'd have like an after party in the suite you're you're right that would, people enjoyed it they always asked for it actually so yeah, go yeah. ahead, Jeff. No, I was going to say, and the real hack, what Michelle did there, Colin, as you pointed out, is we didn't order this stuff from the hotel. We ordered from outside, and now you can do so many delivery services, and that saved an enormous amount of money and, and allowed us to have a lot more stuff at that party than we would have if we were limited to the hotel's catering services. And along the lines of, of money savings and convenience, I'll, I'll rattle off a few more things that are on my lengthy list here. Um, but one thing is important, make sure you have backup internet. Um, some trade shows now will have open internet for everyone for free, um, but it's gonna be very busy and cluttered. So it's a good idea to make sure you have a phone with you that you can do tethering internet from in the booth and that you have obviously uh, the ability to keep that phone charged throughout the trade show. In the old days, you know, um, they used to actually charge you quite a bit of money for internet access. In more recent times, the conference will typically have uh, open Wi-Fi, but it often is very slow and doesn't work well. So you want to bring your own Wi-Fi if you can. Um, the other thing that is a, a lifesaver is bring your own extension cords, right? Um, you don't know where the power plug is going to be in your booth, and they'll charge you 
a lot of money for extension cords if they have to, if you want power at one part of the booth, but the outlet, the way the convention hall is set up, is at a different part of the booth. They're going to charge you an arm and a leg um, for that. So if you just bring a couple of extension cords with you, um, stick them in your suitcase, have them handy, it'll save you a lot of time and money um, when you're in the booth. So I think um, that's really important. And then the last tip now, before I'll be quiet and let some other people share, is I talked earlier about bringing banners with you, bringing the pop-up banners as a backup so you're all set in case your stuff doesn't show up. Well, here's a hack on how to bring those with you on a plane. Oftentimes, these pop-up banners may not fit in your suitcase, especially if you've got a lot of clothes with you. Um, and you don't want to pay excess baggage fees, et cetera, et cetera, with the airlines. Well, guess what? Airlines let you bring golf clubs on the plane, and they treat golf clubs as a regular piece of luggage. It doesn't get an excess baggage fee. You can go to a sporting goods store and buy a very inexpensive hard golf club case. So this is a hard case that's designed to put your golf bag inside of when you travel. They probably cost anywhere from 50 to $75, typically under 100 bucks for a decent hard covered golf club case. And that golf club case is perfect for putting long banners inside and other things that you wanna to bring to the trade show. So I just pack up a golf club case with all of these things, bring it to the airport with me, check it in like I'm checking in a set of golf clubs. They never look inside and it's an easy way. Plus they have wheels typically on them. So they're easy to wheel around. And that's a real easy way to bring banners and other supplies for your trade show with you on the plane uh, and avoid excess baggage charges. So that's another tip. Uh, I know also that you had, um, you did this odd thing. I thought it was odd when you first did it is you bought the television when we were in Vegas and, you and then you offered to give it away at the end of the show or you had a contest or whatever. And why was that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you looked over my shoulder when I was making my list, but yes, buy a TV on Amazon, give it away at the end of the show is right here on my list and buy it on Amazon because then you can have it shipped directly to your hotel or to the trade show. So you're not paying for shipping the TV. If you're a prime member, it's free shipping. And the cost of buying a TV and literally giving it away at the end of the show is significantly less than the cost of renting a TV at the trade show from the AV uh, company that's involved. So typically, if you're going to show video in your booth, if you're going to have a reel playing in the booth, just order the TV on Amazon, send it, just get a new one at every trade show because it's not even worth the cost of shipping it back to your office. And at the end of the show, what we would typically do is give it away. So many shows, another thing is, that's on my list is people love spin to win wheels. Um, if you're looking for fun ways to attract the crowd to your booth, it's very old school, but it really works. People love it. You can get one of these spin to win wheels. You can customize them with whatever swag you want to give away. It draws a crowd to your booth. Um, and then you can use that to get people to get swag at your booth. And then you can put the TV on the last day of the show. You can actually put the TV on the spinning wheel as one of the prizes someone might get for spinning. And if they get it, pack it up, stick it in the box and give it to them. And invariably, you'll find someone who's local to the conference who'd be thrilled to take home that TV. So you're absolutely right, Colin. Can I just say, guys, this is a, a absolutely brilliant topic. It's a fantastic topic. And um, I've just come through a, a conference and I got, I got a few things to share what we did to hack, um, uh, hack what we did at the conference. Um, it, I think that some of you, you've raised some of these things already. And the first one was um, uh, be prepared beforehand that Michelle mentioned. Uh, I always make all my meetings and everything like that. And I check that attendee list as much as uh, as much as I possibly can to find out all the people are going to be there. I really want to get a meeting with because those people will be so busy. You want to lock those meetings in even weeks in advance and make sure you're really prepared for every single meeting. Um, that's one thing. The other thing um, in terms of a, a booth, one of the things we did recently is that we actually hold um, about uh, probably 15 kilograms of chocolate from Australia in little tiny bars from Australia to put on our booth. So it was something unique that people couldn't normally get, but it was something that was consumable and they can go along and, 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 uh, and attracted them to the booth. But the interesting thing with that was, is that 
uh, we were very, very particular about this. We also had that combined with, we used to pin people's lanyards with different, um, different types of pins. Like we had a little kangaroo pin in this case or something like that. And if they had a kangaroo pin on or, or one of the pins we had, then um, they were allowed to have a chocolate, which meant we knew that person had already been spoken to. They could have chocolate and they can come back as many times as they like to in the conference. And so we knew that that person had been spoken to. But not only that, each one of our sales guys, one of our team, had a different type of pin. So we know, knew who spoke to them. Then we had other pins that, that we carried in our pockets when we pinned the lanyard, which meant this particular person is a high value opportunity. And so we went along and uh, pinned their, their lanyard even di differently. Uh, with a different pin so that other members of the team if they met them at a social function at night they would then spend more time with them because to me the whole name of the game of conference is kissing as many frogs as possible to be able to find the princesses and uh, that's the name of the game so so what you don't want to do is have your team talking to the same people over and over and over again and you want to go along and get to the next person, the next person, the next person, and so forth. So, so we had some, some fun things with that. The other thing we did was um, I always tried to front load the beginning of the conference. So I was doing the keynote, and so we had little cards. And we had a giveaway at the keynote session. We gave away an Apple Watch, and people filled in these contact cards and stuff. And immediately after the, 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 my session, the team went through all those cards. And like you're talking about, Michelle, they straight away identified the high value targets and contacted them to make, make meeting times during the rest of the conference. And uh, it, that really worked, that really worked well. So we got a lot of business um, from that, but there's a few hacks from me anyway, and I uh, hope that helps out. I love the the pins and the the pinning and the different codes that the pins stood for, Michael. That's a great idea. You're literally tagging the people who have come to your booth so you could recognize them when you come back. And stickers uh, along those same lines. Stickers are really helpful too, because um, you put stickers on people. They're walking around with your logo and your brand. You put stickers on people's um, badges. You know, we've done pins and stickers um, too. I wanted to share another tip. If you're responsible for setting up the booth, which is typically been my role many times over the years, um, and you're arriving at the con conference center, especially if it's a city you're not familiar with. And I've done trade shows probably in 12 or 15 different countries besides the United States. So you're arriving from the airport, you've got maybe your suitcase, you've got your golf bag full of banners and stuff, maybe you've got some boxes of other things that you actually brought with you, because especially if it's an international show, it's sometimes difficult to ship things in advance, so you end up bringing a lot with you um, when you travel. I would always ask the taxi or Uber driver coming from the airport to first go to the venue, to drive from the airport to the convention center, wherever it was, um, or wherever the venue was being held, uh, and then if it was open, even if it was late at night, I would have them wait and I would go in and deliver all that stuff to my booth and make sure that everything was there. So I didn't have to deal with getting it from the hotel to the convention center the next day. And then the second benefit of doing that is then I'd have them drive me from the venue to the hotel and I'd get a sense of how far away my hotel was from the venue or what type of a commute I would have in the morning when I had to get back to the convention center. Sometimes you're lucky and the convention center is in the hotel you're staying at. And we always recommend staying at the main hotel where the convention is, if that's possible. Even if it's more expensive, the benefit of being where everyone's hanging out, of being in the main venue where you could run into people in the elevators and at the bars, and the benefit of not having to wait on long taxi lines or Uber lines in the morning to get back and forth or at the end of the day, far outweigh the extra cost of staying in the main hotel. So we always recommend staying in the main hotel. But if the hotel and the convention center are not near each other, it's really important when you first arrive that night before to figure out how far apart they are and what your commute's gonna be like so you can plan that in advance. So I always stop by the venue on my way to the hotel. And then if it's possible, I always stay in the main hotel of the event. So Jeff, I remember some fun little tricks we did. Um, you talked about stickers. I remember you walking around and I think in the 
you know, the places where people meet for lunch and stuff, you'd put flyers out on the table or stickers on the table. I remember one event for dot club. Now dot club was an alternative to dot com, dot net, dot org, just to give you an, a perspective. And I remember when we put a sticker, a dot, we were at, uh, at um, I can't remember the name of the hotel, but they called it club, uh, something club. And we went up and, and, you know, late at the night, Tropicana. the Tropicana club. Right. And so we went up and we put a dot in front of the, 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 the club. So everybody in the, in the conference would walk around and how much did it cost us? Zero, a little bit of nerve, right? We didn't get arrested. But we put a dot. We weren't really vandalizing it. We just put a red dot in front of the word club. And so it was a Tropicana dot club. And people who went to the elevators would see that. And I just thought that was a cool little hack. I know it's not relevant, but sometimes at these trade shows, you got to be bold, right? You got to be take a little bit of a risk. Not, I don't think we were vandalizing anything. I don't think we could have got arrested. But sometimes you got to push the envelope a little bit. You know, what do you think about that? Oh, absolutely, Colin. And that was a lot of fun to do. And we were a little bit nervous that we get in trouble with the hotel. But the funny part is people would come up to us and ask how much did we pay for the right to do that? Like other people at the conference assumed that that was some sort of a sponsorship that we arranged um, to be able to put the dot there so that every way you saw Tropicana Club, it was Tropicana Dot Club. And we were there to promote um, the Dot Club domain name extension. So you have to stick your neck out sometimes. There's actually a chapter in my book about um, when I worked for Troma, we were at the American Film Marketing Association Conference, the AFMA in Los Angeles. And this was a trade show where it was inside the hotel. It was in the Century Plaza Hotel. Um, and they basically took all the beds out of the hotel suites and those suites became your offices. So they were in effect the booths. And then the buyers would walk up and down the halls and just go into each room to see what movies were being sold and, and all the rooms were decorated with posters and things. And you weren't allowed to stay in the rooms because the beds had been pulled out and that was really the convention floor. But um, we were a low budget company. My hotel was a cheap, you know, red roof in type place, and it was miles away from the Century Plaza. And frankly, I didn't want to um, commute back and forth every day. So I would sleep in that room, even though it wasn't allowed, behind our posters. So we had some big floor to ceiling posters for our movies and I uh, uh, behind the couch, and I'd pull it away from the wall just enough for me to squeak in and sleep behind them. And the reason why I slept behind them is because security would check the rooms. So each night while I was sleeping behind the posters in the room illegally, you know, the door would open at two or three in the morning, a security card would come in, they'd flip the lights on, look around the room, flip the lights off and leave. Um, thank goodness I didn't snore that much as much then, so I never got caught. And then I would wake up in the morning and quickly shower and change. And, and when they came by in the morning, I would just act as if I had gotten there early. Um, so sometimes, as Colin said, you have to break the rules. You have to uh, take some chances just to make the show go better. Yeah, I, I think, Jeff, that sometimes it's better to ask for, for um, uh, forgiveness than permission <laughs> with, with a lot of these things. Like you're there for a few days and trying to maximize the effectiveness of your time there. And uh, one of the things I also do is if there's a, a bar there or something like that, I find a, wait, a waiter or waitress is going to be there the whole time of the conference. And I tip them really well at the beginning. And, and I say to them, I want you to look after me for this period of time. And uh, I've been at conferences where there's a big, massive queue of people trying to get into this, say, the, the bar of the restaurant. And the waiter beckons me over and ushers me past the queue straight to a, to a table. And, um, and I'm having my meeting straight away with the person. And I'm not just standing there in this huge queue. And that, that's been, that has made me so much money over the years by just doing something like that and really looking after a uh, particular staff member at the same time. Hey, Jeff, can you talk about the bar? Deals at the bar? I mean, that's insane, right? How many deals we did at 1 o'clock in the morning? Absolutely. Well, that goes back to staying in the main hotel, too, because you're greatly increasing your chances of running into people late at night at the bars. But I wanted to mention what Michael was saying. You know, I have on my list, um, too, in bold letters, make friends with the show organizer long before the event. And it's along the lines of what you do, Michael. But I think if you're the one making arrangements for the show, you probably have talked to someone at the organizers about 
securing your booth and the placement of the booth and all that stuff. You want to be super nice to that person. You want to get to know them, make friends with them, email them, even if you have nothing important to say before the event um, to let them know about, you know, that you're excited for the event. And then the first day you arrive, find that person, search for them and say hello and introduce yourself. Make friends with that person right at the beginning and before the show if possible. Because during the show, as Michael said, that person will become your savior. Uh, I have had numerous occasions where maybe I needed a chair or I needed a table or something was the wrong size. And instead of having to wait on long lines, I would just text or email that person or go and find them and speak to them in person, call them by name, be nice to them. And um, anything I needed was taken care of uh, for me. So it's really important to make friends with the show organizer. And by the show organizer, you wanna find the person who runs the show on the floor during the day, not the executive who owns the company. You wanna know who's the person who's running around with a walkie talkie, you know, who's making sure everything's happening that needs to happen. That's the person you wanna make friends with. Give them a t-shirt, give them a t-shirt from your company. You know, give them some cool swag if you have some cool swag. Um, let them know that you appreciate all the hard work they're doing to make the show and it'll pay you back in spades. But can you talk okay. about the bar, the fun, the fun stuff? <laughs> the How do you bar. work a bar? I'm curious because I, I, okay, I know I've had my experiences there. We've you tell well. us, Michelle. Michelle, no, you, no, you, 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 you tell us because you're you're great at this as well. Uh, what I'm good at having glasses of Pinot Noir <laughs> late at night. I definitely agree and with you there. Meeting people. Um, yeah. Well, the, the, but, the uh, thing is. The thing is, Colin, what you're saying is the one thing about these trade shows, it's, it's a 24 hour a day job. So you might have been on your feet all day in the convention hall pitching your stuff. Then you've gone out to a big dinner. Maybe before dinner, there was a cocktail party. Then you went to a dinner with potential clients. Then there was an after party. And then you're barely alive and you walk by the bar. It's 3 a.m. And there's the person you've been trying to meet the entire time. This happened to Colin and I in London once, right? It probably was three in the morning. We were exhausted. We'd been out all night. And finally, there's the person that we've been wanting to talk to all show. So we cornered that person and had a really good, serious, long and, and productive business um, discussion. So you've got to be ready, even after drinking and eating and, and, and whatever, you've always got to be on and always ready because you never know when the moment will arrive where that one person you've been hoping to get time with the entire conference is sitting next to you at the bar or in an elevator with you or in some other situation that was unexpected. And it's such a different tone. Like when you're in the meeting, everybody's dressed up in suits and you're handing out presentations and the stuff, you know, everybody's there and they don't want, they want to look good in front of their um, coworkers or boss. And then you're at the bar and you're just like, Hey, you know, this is how it could actually work. We could just do this. This, there's. A, I feel like they let their guard down a lot more when it comes to um, meeting them in a different setting. The other setting we would also meet them in. Sometimes we'd invite them to a dinner, right? If we knew, we'd try to book key dinners with key yeah. buyers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we, with the, with the dinners that. too, and Michelle is the, is the master of making reservations at amazing places at trade shows. But also when we would book dinner reservations, we'd book a bigger table than we actually knew we needed because you always want to have the opportunity to invite that special person to join you at the last minute if you're able to. So if there's four of you, don't book a table for five, book a table for eight, you know, so that you have room to invite some people. And some of our best business dinners of some of these conferences were ones where we booked a big table and kind of randomly invited some key people and it turned into um extremely fruitful uh, business the worst yeah. though i see the worst is when you see companies and they got their shirts on and it's the first night of the conference and they're all having dinner together by themselves with no clients oh that's right very annoying. That, that infuriates all the time. me you see that michael Oh, yeah, that just drives me crazy. Well, they get in these little holy huddles and they just talk to one another. And I'm thinking, stop, like, seriously? Like, you're in a target-rich environment. Stop talking to each other. You'll do that at the office. <laughs> it's like, let's get on with it. Right. Yeah, and I would say 
you know, a lot of people are there obviously alone because not everyone's exhibiting with a big team, but you know, your prospect might have sent the person that makes the decision or who can get you to that decision. So don't be shy. I, I think that's a big thing. Everybody's there, it's work and they're away from their family or other interests. So I think just don't be shy, be very inclusive um, and friendly. It's an amazing opportunity, obviously, to not only um, meet people and make connections, but also to make discoveries um, about things that your customer wants, which is absolutely critical to keep you on strategy as well as what competitors are doing. So I wanna add another one, Jeff. Uh, this is one that obviously we employ a, a lot, which is, you know, you get the, you know, the brochure from the show organizers. It has set plans, set, you know, menus, so to speak, set list of what you get. Don't be afraid to negotiate and change the package in a way that you know will help you get better recognition. One thing for us is we always, always try to get a speaking spot. Speaking spots are infinitely um, useful. It's you, you're up in front of everybody. Everybody immediately starts to know who you are and the company starts to get associated with some level of expertise. People will just start you know, introducing themselves to you. People will start asking you questions. Speaking engagements can be very, very valuable. And a lot of times we would get the lower end package and then we would negotiate really hard to get a speaking engagement. So that's my hack. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that one. It's one we do a, a lot, um, Michelle is really go for the speaking the speaking spots but you've got to make sure that when you when you speak that you're adding value to the attendees don't do a sales pitch add value and that's the thing you got to really think about because people can they, they they're so over the sales pitch you know and um I, I just think you've always got to think about what are the what's the value i'm adding just just on dinners the other thing i should mention about dinners is really think about who you're going to invite to your dinner what you don't want to have is a really big client and there's a, a quite a small client together you want the big clients together and then you want say the medium and the smalls and maybe a different dinner or something like that they're still worthwhile talking to but you don't want to mess that up too much i find is you want the, the same caliber of, of organizations sort of um, uh, trading off one another. And also think about if you don't want a, a dinner where everyone is introverts, um, otherwise it's gonna be like a very awkward dinner. So think about the personalities as well uh, in, the, in that process of who's gonna be at the dinner. It's, it's quite a bit of finessing in that. And more in particular, when you sit at the table um, for a business meeting, or for a dinner or anything, think about that if, you, if you're going to be sort of guide, how are you going to guide the conversation? Like in a business meeting, and if you've got two people in the business meeting, what you don't want to do is put um, the other person um, in a position where they've got to play tennis. So they're looking at you, then they're looking at your colleague, and then look at you, and then looking at a colleague, like backwards and forwards. Put it so they walk, essentially look in one direction and they're seeing you both at the same time. There's all sorts of different things you can do there to make it easier for them um, before any business meeting. So be careful where you sit down at the table. Wow, this is insane, all of these tips and tricks. And if you're in the audience and you have one, please raise your hand. It's Friday afternoon. It's, it's, a, it's a nice room and we're relaxed and we're talking and you might have an idea of something you did. I know a couple of weeks ago, we had someone who had come on the show and talked about, um, so every show they hand you a lanyard and a, a little badge that you put around your neck and, you know, but what he did is he, he brought in a custom one. Now in his case, it was huge. Like it was like a sandwich board sign or something like that. But just the idea of swapping out the standard lanyard. Now you might need that lanyard and badge to get through the gate, you know, security and stuff, but you can still have another one that's different than the one that everybody else has. And that will really make you stand out. I thought that was a pretty cool trick. 
So if you have an idea and you're in the audience, come on stage, raise your hand. We'd love to have you up. Excellent. So Jeff, talk a little bit about some more of your hacks. Yeah. Like I'm interested, like you're really good at making sure the brand is all yeah. over the place in a very simple way. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Colin touched on it earlier, but I, I really think you can't stress it in, enough, is you gotta wear your logo attire at all times. And I mean at all times. If, if you Again, if you're the one selling, there's, there's two different strategies. If you're at a trade show and you're a buyer, it's a completely different strategy because if you're a buyer, you may not want everyone to know who you are because you don't want to be inundated with people trying to sell you stuff. You want to be selected. But if you are selling, if you're at a show and your purpose there is to sell something, right, then there's no excuse to not be wearing your logoed shirts 100% of the time. And I mean 100% of the time. I mean, if you're going out to a fancy dinner at a steakhouse, you're still wearing your logo shirt. You're not switching clothes because you never know who's going to see you and recognize the company as someone that they want to talk to. I can't tell you how many times we've been in an elevator and someone stopped and said, oh, do you work with Doc Club if I was wearing a Doc Club shirt? You know, I've heard about that. Can you tell me more? So when you're there for the purpose of selling, you should be wearing your logo shirt at all times because you never know where it's going to get the attention of someone you might want to be selling to. So I encourage you to wear it 100% of the time. I know a lot of people wear it when they're in the booth because their boss told them they had to. And as soon as they get a chance to strip it off and put something else on, they do. I think that's a mistake. You should be wearing it 100% of the time if you're a seller. If you're a buyer, not so much. But if you're a seller, 100%. The other thing Com for brand Com Michelle, and just just, be, just before, before you yeah, go sorry. on that, Jeff. Sorry, Jeff. I, I I need to absolutely emphasize that what you said there is just so important, and it should be that every single person has the attire, and it, it, it's very clear what it is. When I say every single person, for instance, in this last uh, conference, my wife was just traveling with me, but I made sure that she had a, a branded sh um, shirt that she wore. And she we may have gone at some of the social functions and she was still wearing our shirt, I'll tell you. Because to me, that was another opportunity to go along and, and put the brand out there. So you may have like uh, significant others with you or something like that, even your kids, I don't care. Make sure they're wearing the shirt. Get them a and shirt. That's, that's like just it's so free funny, advertising, it's easy. I know, but I'm amazed again, back to that, you know, point earlier about the people just sitting and talking to each other. How many times I've seen businesses like at the domain conferences, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, we go to these conferences and maybe two or three companies, including our company, had our our company logo on it. But everybody else got nice sport jackets. They're looking really nice. And, you know, how many times like it costs you almost nothing to feature your company as a startup, well, why not wear the merchandise? It's we're trying to make money here. We're not yeah. trying to be cool. Exactly. We actually got um, like polo shirts and everything like that, but we also got really nice jackets to wear just in case we happen to go to a, a, a geo region which was cold. And but they're always branded. Everything is branded, and it's absolutely critical to me um, that because it's just, it's just free, like. Like the 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 um, uh, conference convener didn't even charge you to do that. It's like it's a free item, so like just do it. <laughs> yeah, just and just to finish up uh, the talk about the the branding stuff that Michelle asked. So a little bit about booth etiquette. Um, you know, when you're manning the booth or womaning the booth, as the case may be, but when you're in your booth, um, number one, never sit down in your booth. Now, granted, you're going to be on your feet all day. You want to take a break. When you want to take a break, leave your booth. Go sit in the, the dining area or go sit in a lounge. Go sit somewhere else to rest your feet. Don't rest in the booth. When you're in the booth, everyone in your booth should be on their feet, working the booth, you know, working the customers. That doesn't mean you can't take a break and get off your feet. Just don't do it in the booth. The other thing is when you leave the booth, anytime you leave the booth, Maybe you're going to the restroom. Maybe you want to walk the floor and look at some of the other booths. Maybe you're going to go uh, for lunch. Anytime you leave that booth, 
grab a handful of swag, flyers, whatever, whatever collateral you have in the booth, bring a supply of it with you. Because when you're walking around, and again, you're wearing your logo shirt, you never know who's going to come up to you and say, oh, what's that club? I heard about it. Boom, you've got the flyer right in your hand. Oh, here's our sales flyer. Take a look at this. Here's my business card. Oh, can I put a sticker or a pin on your badge? All those things that you have in the booth, you want to have them in your hands anytime you leave the booth to walk around so that you're bringing your booth with you wherever you go. I think that's really I important. I yes, remember Tom. researching the best type of shoes you can buy for a trade show, and I found Gravity to Fire shoes. It's hilarious. I know they got little springs in them and whatnot, but they made a huge difference, the type of shoes, because you're right. You stand up for 16 hours a day. It's tough. Yeah. I... And with flyers and collateral, one of the thing is, you know, Colin mentioned this earlier. We'll typically I carry a stack with me. And if you're walking through the, the dining area where all the tables are up elite, put your flyers on the tables, put them at the bar, put them in random places. And sometimes if you're at a trade show where you know the hotel has blocks of rooms that are dedicated to the trade show, if you make nice with um, someone at the front desk, they might tell you, oh, yeah, the trade show book floors five, six and seven. So then you know that everyone who's staying on floors five, six and seven is part of this trade show. So what do you do? At midnight, before you go to bed or 2 a.m. or whenever it is, before you go to bed, grab a bunch of your flyers, go up to floors five, six, and seven, and slide one of your flyers under every door um, on those floors because everyone in those rooms is part of that trade show, and now they're going to get your collateral. Sometimes you can get in trouble. I've been in situations where the hotel, you know, someone complained and the hotel um, – stopped it because sometimes they actually charge for that the hotels organizers charge you to put stuff under the doors but if you're clever you can figure it out uh, and you can do that same thing with vehicles you know um when i was in the entertainment industry we would go to the Cannes film festival every year and what we would do is we'd put our flyers and collateral underneath the windshield wipers on every single car that was parked up and down the Crescent, which is the main street that everyone who's at the Cannes Film Festival has to walk along every day, all day long. So we would put our flyers under the windshield wipers of cars so people would see them as they walked around. So there's a lot of creative ways you can get that brand around. And a lot of it is tied to always having an ample supply of flyers, stickers, pins, collateral, T-shirts. It's great to give T-shirts to people. They'll wear them. It promotes your brand. All that stuff can help you get more bang for your buck at a trade show. Excellent. So we have Noelle who's joined us on the stage. Noelle, we'd love to hear from you. That's so funny because I used to play many roles. I was uh, a conference planner and developer meeting planner. I worked in hotels. I did AV and catering. So so I know these hacks that you guys are doing and they're so fun. Um, I just wanted to share that. Oh, I was invited up, but I wanted to share that at NamesCon, I'm, I guess I'm a domainer, but I don't sell domains. So I didn't know anybody there. And what I did is I rode the elevators for the first 10 minutes at the conference and met like six people. And then I was kind of set and it was nice because we were confined and it was easy to ask questions. So I really liked that idea as well. And I love the idea of encouraging to be a speaker at a conference. When I went to South by my first time, I went as a volunteer just to scout it out. Then the second time I came as a speaker and I got to trade. So I think that's a nice way to do projects as well. And I love this so topic. No, this should turn yeah. into a book. <laughs> Oh my gosh, even Jeff, maybe you should turn into a book. Noel, before you answer Jeff, Noel uh, or Jeff, uh, either one of you, uh, this idea of speaking and Michelle talked about establish yourself as an expert in your industry. One of the best ways to do that is to get on stage. How do you do that? How do you, how do you get yourself a speaking gig at one of your trade shows? Maybe start with you, Noel. Uh, yeah, that actually could be a whole topic in another room. Um, um... I know I put you on the spot, right? Yeah, I, I, no, no, no. I'm just, I, I have, well, I have so many different types of clients, such big ones and small ones. And things for, I mean, Apple and Oracle and things. Um, I think sometimes going to the client direct, not just the conference planner, but the, the client direct and getting some marketing materials for that client, either your materials emailed or in the old days mailed. 
And then when they meet with a conference planner, if you talk to the, the show organizer or the producer, they should be tickled as well so that when they talk and they're throwing ideas out, both of you guys have a little starting point. I think that when we suggested something and they already had known about it, it was more likely to advance, even if it was they weren't sure if it was the right fit, just the fact that uh, we were marketed from both sides. Yeah, I think one of the things uh, is obviously always to get to know know the the, the conference convener as, as well. And the conference what? Very openly, Can you uh, say it again? The convener. Convener. The conference convener. Is that a yeah. word we uh, use the person, in the U.S.? The person who's putting on the conference. Okay, um, got it. And to get to know them and and, and give the pitch. They're they're looking for content for the conference conference, but they're looking for good quality content. And so give the pitch to them of, hey, I can speak on this and it's going to be just awesome. And these are the reasons why. And here's the four points I'm going to cover. Yeah. And then make it easy for them. So you've already dropped up that one paragraph summary, which they can just put it straight into the program. They don't have to think about it anymore. And that spot's filled. And now it's going to be really good. Yeah, um, definitely. Definitely looking at past um, agendas for conferences and also reading their current trends like um, their media files, what's what's new for them, what catchphrases are, and then incorporating that in. And again, keeping it simple and um, showing them how that your turnkey is always the best. And I know they generally ask for speakers like a year in advance or eight months in advance. You can't just the month before the conference say, hey, I'd like to speak. So keeping your eyes open for when they call for speakers is, is maybe another thing. Any thoughts on this topic, Jeff? Yeah, well, a couple of things. So, so going back to befriending the show organizers, you know, that's really important, too, because I had this happen to me. Michelle, you might remember where um, at the last minute we decided to attend the show and I tried to get a speaking engagement, but it was way too late. But then someone backed out and the show organizer who knew, um, you know, had seen me speak at other shows. Uh, offered me an opportunity to speak at the last minute as a replacement, which of course I was happy to do. So again, the more friendly you are with the ho with the organiz organizers, the more likely those opportunities will come up. And if you haven't spoken at shows before, um, you know it's so easy now to make videos of ourselves doing something. Literally make a video of yourself giving a presentation, even if it's just you in an empty room. They don't know it's not in front of an audience. And you know, have, point the camera on yourself present and speak as if you're speaking in front of an audience um, and just give a presentation, do your best job because almost every show is gonna wanna see, if they're not familiar with you already or if they haven't seen you speak, they're going to want to see you speak. But that doesn't mean you have to have spoken at 10 conferences already. Just show them on a video that you're capable of getting up in front of a, a room or, a, or an audience and giving a thoughtful and meaningful and informative and entertaining presentation. And you could literally just do that alone uh, to create that video. But again, when you're doing it alone, don't look like you're alone. Make sure you're looking at the camera and speaking to the camera as if you're speaking to a full house in an auditorium. Yeah, and along that lines, you don't always have to be like, I'm the speaker and it's just me standing up here. Panels are a fantastic way to really meet people and get in front of an audience without all the burden or the nerves or whatever of doing a formal presentation. So never, you know, dismiss that type of opportunity as well. I personally really like doing panels. You get an opportunity um, to, you know, build a different kind of rapport on stage and with the audience. Hey, can, I, can I say something about, about this? Is that over time, if you're doing speaking engagements and you're constantly adding value um, to the audience, then what happens is the audience know that when you're going to be speaking, that that's going to be really worthwhile to, to attend to. And you'll end up getting, dare I say, a following. And the, the, the conference organizers know this. And they want to go along and make sure that the, the, the attendees really like, like the content, all that sort of stuff. And so it becomes easier over time. And just your point, um, Michelle, on panels, um, I'm very picky which panel I will go on. And I look at the people on the panel beforehand to determine whether, yeah, I'm going to be on this panel or not. Because sometimes what you don't want to have is your brand mixed up 
with someone who, dare I say, is doing questionable things in your industry or has a reputation which is not as, not that good, and be very, very careful to keep your brand separate from that. And that's the only thing I would say about panels, but I've had a lot of panels and there have been great times and really good people on them and that sort of stuff. We've had fantastic discussions. Um, but just be very wary about your brand and if there's other people in the industry which are less savory, I'll, I'll put it that way, um, and making sure that they're not trying to get some of your brand's glamour for their own benefit as such. Yeah. Um, you mentioned just um, – this is a secret I use. So my husband's an astronomer, and he's asked to speak all over the place. But now I'm choosing where I want to go. And so I'm contacting destinations like Hawaii and Thailand and other places and letting them know about our services for incoming groups because I wouldn't mind pairing with them on those kind of adventures. But also when I'm in my audience or when you have your other team in the audience, I'm saying to people, I see who likes it. I'm like, make, let the conference planner know. Please highlight us on the survey. So I do a whole bunch of afterbounding. <laughs> you know, I walk the room and uh, plant seeds and then – uh, get feedback. These people said they like this. And then we've been invited back. We, we're doing one conference five years in a row. So um, understand the audience and see them as valuable people to market for you. Hey, Jeff, that brings up a good point. You know, after the conference, um, do you have any tricks for that? Like, you know, you've done this conference, it's ended. Is it over or do you keep working the list? I mean, you grab their business cards, you might have scanned their badge. What happens after the conference? Well, Michelle, Michelle talked about this at the beginning of the hour. I mean, the follow up is is 90 percent uh, of the impact of the show. So it's really important that you do follow up with the business cards you collected or the lead lists you collected. Um, and that's why it's important to make your show presence memorable. Right. Because when you follow up, you can refer back to it. So, you know, Joe uh, Noel met those people in the elevators going up and down. I'm sure that when she followed up, she says, hey, I'm Noel, I met you in the elevator at the such and such hotel. And they're going to remember that as opposed to just remembering, you know, people walking around. So you want to um, follow up and make your follow up personal. Um, a lot of times I will get emails after a trade show I've attended from people whose booths I never went to. And it just says, hey, Jeff, thanks for coming by our booth and telling us how interested you are in our product. And I know I never went to their booth and I know that they just bought or got the list of attendees and they're just sending everyone in that list the same email. Um, it would be much more impactful if it acknowledged, hey, Jeff. I'm sorry that you didn't have a chance to come by our booth because they didn't collect my name at the booth. You know, here's what you missed or something to make it personal. So you want to don't just blast the attendee list after the show, um, as most people do, but go through the cards, make notes during the show when you talk to someone. So when you follow up with them, you can reference something you discussed in the booth. Hey, I remember when you came by our booth and you mentioned that you um, had one of our products or, you know, do something to make it personal. So it's not just a mass mailing to a list. So you're going to get a much better result that way, I think. And Jeff, I know one thing you've done, and I've seen you do it with Paw.com, I've seen you do it with Dot Club, is we're going to a trade show for the first time. And you tell them, look, I'm a startup, I'm just getting going. Can you give me a discount this year? And if it works out well, I'll pay the full rate next year. Absolutely. Everything is negotiable and, and, and pleading poverty as a young startup is a good way to negotiate. And to, to Michelle's point at, earlier, which was a great point um, to emphasize, is you don't have to limit yourselves to the standard sponsorship opportunities. You know, if you want to be creative, if you want to do something that's outside of what they've asked for, they'd be happy to take your money, plus you can pay less for those kinds of sponsorships because it isn't part of their menu already. So you might come up with a creative idea, like we once did a coin. Uh, we printed up a thousand coins, actual metal coins, and we wanted them to give everyone a coin, one of our coins, when they picked up their badge at the booth. That was not something that was in their um, sponsorship opportunities bag they didn't have a set price for it right so we just were able to negotiate well look they're handing them the badge anyway how much extra work is it going to be for them to also hand them one of our coins we'll pay for the coins why don't you do this for us for a very low cost and we paid very little 
um, for the right to have them give everyone our coin when they came in. So you can be creative and do things that are not part of the sponsorship menu. Um, and as Colin said, you know, you can do things that are, are, are creative and, and make you stand out without spending a lot of money. Yeah, I, I agree with you just on that, uh, Jeff, is everything is negotiable. And I don't think I've ever done a conference where we've taken uh, the packages as such as, as, as written. Um, we've always crafted something which worked well with our brand and went well with the entire strategy around what we were trying to achieve at the conference. And um, when that strategy gets in place, you can maximize the effectiveness of what you're trying to do. And lo and behold, you get it for less. But I loved your idea of the coin. That's great. I have to uh, apologize. I have uh, to jump to a three o'clock meeting, but this has been a great discussion. I, I didn't even go through all the things on my list, so we can do this again. And I'd love to hear more tips and hacks from other people uh, like Noel uh, about what they've done at the show. But I'm going to have to jump right now. But um, Michelle and Colin, thank you so much for this opportunity. Absolutely. And it's been a great show today. Uh, I know the blog, Mimi's in the audience here. We're going to try to come up with 50. So if you missed, even though you might have not got everything in there, Jeff, um, on the blog, you can go to the website startup.club and you'll be able to read 50 uh, trade show hacks. It was a bit of a niche topic, you know, but next week we have something that's a little bit more broad and it's the art of war startup lessons for modern entrepreneurs. And Rucha, I know you're new to Clubhouse. Welcome. Uh, I came across her article and I read it about a month and a half ago and I was just blown away. I love the book, The Art of War, and you put it in context for startups. Are you able to just give us like a 30 second sort of clip of what we're going to talk about next week? And uh, you, yeah. Yes, sure, Colin. Thank you so much uh, for introducing me. Uh, when uh, we talk about The Art of War, the book, People often associate it with politics, right? But that's not the case. In fact, we can use those war analogies for almost everything that we do, including entrepreneurship. And that's why uh, that's what I focused on when I was uh, writing that article. And that is what we will be discussing next Friday as well. That's how you can use uh, those strategies with the Master Sue wrote uh, thousand, 2,000 years ago in fact, and it has lived through that time. And if this is something that I'll see you, we can discuss it in the next time. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's going to sound great. I know your voice sounded a little muffled today, so maybe we'll work on the microphone for next week, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, it's an incredible book. I read the article. I'm going to read the article again. Uh, if you just search The Art of War for Startups on Google, you'll see her article. And she talks about, you know, she lines it up with the book. It's pretty cool. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much, Noel and Michael and Michelle for coming on stage. Uh, we do have a huge author coming on to this show next, other than, other than Ruth, Ruth, Rucha, is that how you pronounce your name, Rucha? Uh, yes, Colin, Rucha. Yes. Oh, by the way, very much better, much better when you just came on right now. That was much better, by the way, from a sound perspective. I'm glad we practiced. But we have another huge author coming on next next month. I'm not going to tell you the name yet, uh, and you're not going to find out unless you go on to startup.club and sign up for that mailing list. And uh, we've had so many great authors and serial entrepreneurs and billionaires come on this show. Uh, really, really exciting. And you can get um, you can get access to this show. We are now a podcast by going to your favorite podcast channel and searching for Serial Entrepreneur Club. Michelle, close it out. Excellent. This has been an amazing show and we're looking forward to seeing everybody next week. So like Colin said, make sure you go to www.startup.club. You can see over 200 past recording shows and podcasts. There's an amazing amount of knowledge and, um, you know, it's all free. So, you know, feel free. We, we'd love for everyone to go up there and benefit from it. So have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mahalo. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later, everyone.